Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, uh, my name is Morris Fallon. I'm an associate professor at the University of Oxford. Uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, our research in multi-sensor uh, SLAM and um, robot navigation. I, um, our team focuses on uh, multi-sensor systems and we try to drive things towards mobile autonomy in the same way as the CMU team have talked about. Um, focus quite a lot on legged systems because they kind of embody all the mobile sensors that we have uh, on self-driving cars or aerial platforms. Um, for example, uh, high quality IMUs, again, in, in the same manner as Shibo mentioned, are quite central to robot navigation. And legged systems have, have joint sensing, joint kinematics. I won't talk too much about those today. Obviously for environment sensing, depth cameras, and then moving up to things that are more about navigation external facing cameras and, and LiDAR systems. So the same kind of multi-sensor fusion that was talked about in the previous talk, and also the same kind of test environment. So this is the DARPA challenge. Um, and we see the, the animal robot with locomotion controllers from, from our colleagues at ETH, uh, exploring the environment where it's entirely pitch black and the robot's carrying on board, but lighting and its own sensors to, to map and navigate the environment. And you can see these kind of degenerate scenarios that occur where the where the robot needs to be able to fuse together sensor modalities, not just operating off of a single sensor, uh, off, off a single sensor, whether it's legged kinematics, which is typically very robust, but low, uh, but having some degree of, of drift, um, laser, which in very narrow environments like this, um, struggles to form six degree of freedom constraints, and vision, which can struggle in different lighting conditions. So our research in, in Oxford has developed a a uh, sensor, a uh, multi-sensor suite called uh, uh, VLANs, uh, which combines together these different odometries. So reaching back a few years, this is an illustration of a uh, multi-sensor um, vi visual odometry plus kinematics. So the contribution from the legs effectively is a kind of noisy measurement of velocity um, on the assumption that the robot's foot is in contact with the ground and that velocity measurement can, can give you a slowly drifting uh, odometry. Um, but incorporating that with vision is illustrated in the video. I uh, hear a rather typical approach of, of sparse visual uh, inertial odometry um, and done in the right way to be able to, for example, back out inherent biases in the, in the legged contribution can give us a good incremental motion estimate. As we move to the DARPA challenge, for example, the question arose of how to incorporate LIDAR as it's ultimately the most accurate sensor in the, these kind of environments. And here are a few examples from the literature of different approaches that used for example, different kind of multiplexers or health evaluation modules. So multiplexer is effectively a switch between different sensor modalities. If you determine one, one modality is failing, like your LiDAR, fall back to your vision or fall back to your wheel or leg odometry. Um, and health monitors are effectively those components. Typically, these are loosely coupled approaches. And um, we wanted to look to develop something that was a bit more tightly coupled uh, with, with, with vision and LiDAR. So we're retaining as far as visual feature approach, but then we also wanted to develop a a feature-based approach for the LiDAR fusion. So from a LiDAR point cloud, we wanted to be able to extract um, uh, features in the environment, so edges or planar patches, um, to track those over time and to merge them in the same estimation framework as we were carrying out with vision. So uh, least squares, windowed optimization, um, and these are the different factors. So um, an IMU prior for pre-integrating the IMU related to, to work from, from, from Luca, for example. Um, planes uh, from the LIDARs, edges from our edges or lines uh, observed from the LIDAR, and also visual features uh, tracked from the camera system. Um, again, a windowed optimization that fuses those together. And we deployed that in a variety of tests in the run up to the DARPA subterranean challenge. And you can see here an illustration of, of operating in a, in a mine environment. This is a top down view. And there's a green line, which corresponds to ground truth inferred from a, from a prior scan with a tripod based system. Um, and you can see that there's very little, little drift in this environment. Moving towards sort of more, more challenging environments here, entering a narrow corridor, a narrow, narrow tunnel in a, in, a, in a disused mine. In this scenario, you've no LIDAR constraints in the up-down direction and in the longitudinal axis, it's, it's ill-defined. So we're switching between the modality, or not switching between the modalities, but fusing different components of, of, the, of the modalities together. So that, that approach was, um, uh, quite successful, but one of the challenges, quite successful, quite ac very accurate, quite robust to different sensor re uh, redundancies, but ultimately 
the lighter system tends to be the most accurate. And a, a kind of a reflection from that is that um, a different approach that maybe takes, that recognizes that there's sort of fundamental vari uh, variations in, in the relative accuracy of the sensor modality is important. And I did like the, the, the presentation earlier, which touched upon how, how we can do this. Um, I feel a, a sort of a, a lighter a hierarchy based off of the, the perceived or the expected uh, accuracy of the different modalities is important in super odometry is uh, one contribution for that. Um, moving on from odometry per se to, to, to large scale mapping, wrapped around our odometry system, we have uh, a large scale SLAM system. This is just an illustration of the work. It's not necessarily a particularly, um, particularly uh, novel contribution, but it's a large scale multi-factor um, multi-factor, uh, multi-sensor, uh, laser-based mapping system that can scale to large-scale facilities and, and in, a, in a very accurate manner. I since won a couple of uh, mapping competitions in, uh, in 2021. Um, and it can also be adapted from the robot, robotic system to, to more handheld applications. Um, we, in 2021 and 2022, we were participants and then organizers in of the uh, Hilti Slam Challenge, which has been quite impactful in robotics, um, collecting very high accuracy uh, uh, ground truth for, for the sensor system, um, specifically trying to target um, millimeter accuracy by using very high, accurate, very high accuracy tripod based system that you can see in the bottom left to capture very accurate prior models. And then placing a handheld sensor payload at crosshairs throughout the facility to be able to um, to back out at reference points, millimeter accuracy of the sensor payload. So as, as uh, maybe, maybe the arc of, to observe is that as SLAM has become more accurate, um, moving down from uh, meters of, of error to centimeters, then, then uh, the, 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 the necessity to have multi-challenge um, data sets, like, like the one that was just been presented for the, um, by, the, by the organizers, but also um, for, um, for, for going down to extreme accuracy as well. So um, if you're interested, I suggest checking out the healthy challenges. Um, on, on the back of that and using those data sets, then we've, we've been able to, to, to develop um, uh, multi-mission fusion. So this is a, a, a bundle adjustment based approach to merging together uh, different missions into a single uh, combined reconstruction with the red edges indicating uh, loop closures uh, between different missions on different days. And, then, and this starts to open up different applications for long-term monitoring. Um, uh, but obviously to be able to, to join those missions together, you need to be able to create constraints between missions and that's effectively the problem of LIDAR-based uh, place recognition or localization. So this is a work that we call InstaLock, which uh, takes the, uh, an instance-based approach to indoor LIDAR localization. Obviously there's a vast amount of work done on outdoor local localization using things like Kitty, here we wanted to focus on LIDAR-based um, indoor localization. LIDAR-based because if we're operating in very poorly lit situations, then vision would, would, would be a modality that we would struggle with, although we, we, would, be, we would use that as well. Um, and we're, here, we're, here we're using a, a wide field of view LIDAR. So you can see that this particular LIDAR has a, has a larger field of view. So it's a get, getting something akin to a full point cloud reconstruction of the environment. Um, the first step of the approach is to carry out panoptic um, segmentation so, uh, to segment out uh, different instances of objects that are present. So walls, tables, benches, chairs, uh, ceilings and floors. Um, and then relative to a prior model, uh, identifying those instances, creating, um, creating matches between them and then using that to, to, to back out a uh, pose estimate within a prior model. Just a little bit about the, the method. Um, we're using the, the soft group met method to uh, carry out the panoptic segmentation. And then we're uh, identifying a single descriptor by pulling down the individual uh, object instance point clouds. So by definition, this requires a relatively dense LIDAR. It's not, it's not, it's not necessarily gonna work with a 16 beam LIDAR scanned in an indoor environment. Here we're using uh, 64 or 128 beam LIDARs. Um, we we'll train, train the method entirely with simulated data. So this is data um, uh, synthesized from, uh, from the Unreal Engine using the AirSlim, AirSim plugin. Um, and that obviously avoids the need to, to do hand labeling. So we were extracting the semantic label directly from, from the simulator. And this is an illustration of some of the, um, some of the environments. Uh, so this is uh, 
a, one of the buildings in, in Oxford. So multi-floor reconstruction is the prior model and individual instances of point clouds are what we're matching against. So just pause the video here. You can see a single LiDAR scan at a particular instance in time is being segmented into different um, object instances. And then those object instances, when there's a successful match is shown here. So you can see different instances and they're being matched to the prior model where we have sufficient number of those, maybe in the order of five object instances that are successfully matched. We're able to use a ransack based approach to infer the, the pose estimate. So as you see the video going along here, you can see flashes of, of near parallel lines. Those correspond to successful loop closures. Um, and you can get a feel for the precision and recall there. So it's sufficiently accurate to be able or sufficiently uh, high recalls be able to be used as a place recognition algorithm uh, without needing to rely on vision, which would be a typical approach in this kind of scenario. Uh, on the basis of this kind of work, we've uh, we've formed a spin out recently to to move towards uh, monitoring construction sites, uh, doing repeated scanning, and here are some illustrations of the kind of capabilities you can determine. So this is relative to a building model being able to identify construction errors or deviations relative to plans. Okay, so up to this up to this point, I've only talked about lidar base, and there's not really been any vision except for its contribution to odometry. Um, uh, obviously, there's been an explosion of work in in the nerf space, um, and uh, it kind of attaches or is a joint to to the problem of slam. Um, uh, however, these kind of approaches typically tend to be object centric, so scanning around objects with, with views pointing towards objects, while the robot, robotics context, particularly robots that are in inspection environments, typically move to the scene, the scene and aren't going to orientate their sensors so as to be uh, to, to, to kindly reconstruct an object of interest. But we do have the capacity to augment our sensor system. So this is a sensor payload we've been developing for a few years. Um, it's made up of uh, white uh, fisheye cameras that are pointing in, in, in three different directions, forward, left, and right, as well as a wide field of view lighter. So we're, we're instead of creating an object-centric and, and based nerf reconstruction pipeline. This is a, a trajectory-centric approach where, we're, where we instead have sensors pointing in different directions. Um, before, um, before getting into that, of course, the, the key challenge is the, the multi-sensor aspect. So uh, calibration between the sensors is crucial. Here you can see um, using the CAD model to directly project uh, the, the CAD prior to, to project the LiDAR into the camera image. So you can see uh, it's coarsely overlaid. You can see the LiDAR intensity in purple kind of overlaying on the black. Um, that's low intensity and high intensity LiDAR returns are the, are the, are the green and yellow. We're going to use that cue to precisely align the sounds. Um, a typical approach would be to, to determine the boundary of a, a calibration target, as you can see here. But uh, that, that, that's, that's quite difficult to, to use in practice. It, it requires the human to know about the field of view of the LiDAR. Typically, the cameras have got sufficiently large field of view, but the LiDAR can be very, very, um, very small field of view. So you can get a feel on the left hand side about how far the operator of the calibration system would need to be to be able to fully capture the calibration target. So instead, we're able to operate on partial views of the calibration by creating a differentiable calibration module. So we've we've detected the calibration target in the upper parts of these images, and then we construct this calibration pattern, and that can create a um, a differentiable um, differ a differentiable alignment target. So we're able to co-register the lidar to the to this um, calibration target, as illustrated here, and uh, without the necessity for their full, to be full overlap. And that also allows us to be able to create more diverse views and to, to achieve kind of one pixel uh, error in our reprojection of the LiDAR. So armed with um, three LiDAR images, um, or LiDAR depth images and three cameras that are, that are directly overlaid with one another, um, our trajectory from our SLAM system, uh, then our, our NERF pipeline uh, first, first refines those poses using CallMap. So we, we do find that final refinement with, with CallMap does improve the PSNR of, of our NERF reconstructions. Um, but in many cases, the trajectory that we provide with our SLAM system is essential because CallMap otherwise can actually estimate the trajectory without a prior. Uh, so that, that gives us both a speed up and, an, and a robustness improvement. And then as we look to the, to the NERF reconstruction, 
if it's just a vision-based approach in these texture-free environments, as you can see with Nerfactor, which is a baseline approach or the, the approach we, we adapted from, um, this, this gravity area on, on, on the texture-free environment uh, is unable to reconstruct the scene. Um, using the, the depth is a good step in the right direction. We can see that it's starting to provide a, a, a reconstruction as, as observed from the surface normals, but then moving on and computing normals directly on the, the lighter point clouds, and the point cloud reconstruction gives us an extra boost here. So we're starting to see um, both in the texture rich environments, but also in the texture poor environments, um, uh, that kind of reconstruction. So here's the, the sort of the A of uh, visual only pipeline from Nerfacto. Um, and you can see in particular in this portion here where there's very little reconstruction, while in, in the lighter aided approach, it's both um, it's both got a, a geometric back end, so there's a point cloud that can be extracted from this reconstruction, but also we're able to reconstruct the views that only have a sort of a single passing sweep by this drone platform mm -hmm. that collected this data. Here's, here's another large scale reconstruction. It's broken up into several submaps, still working on the submap um, approach. But you can see the um, you can see the um, the uh, the the incorporation of the lidar, which contributes to the overall reconstruction. Um, yeah, some takeaways from this are that uh, most of the data was taken from autonomous robots um, uh, operating on, uh, with, with a traditional SLAM approach. The SLAM trajectory greatly speeds up training time, and um, it is necessary still to refine the poses and the, the intrinsics with, uh, with um, the comac based um, uh, bond adjustment. And just to, to re-emphasize the point, there's a... Uh, uh, point cloud geometric back into this. It's not simply a rendering based pipeline. So this is a point cloud that's taken from the, the overall system. Okay, uh, so moving on to kind of a, a purely vision based topic. Um, we looked at uh, the emergence of LMs and we wanted to look at how they could contribute to semantic based mapping to sort of break down the, the approach typically used in SLAM, to, to, which has developed uh, traditional feature based um, uh, place recognition modules that are kind of hand curated, things like Debo, for example. Um, building on, upon our multi-sensor odometry system that I mentioned previously, specifically multi-camera odometry, we have a, a camera system that has overlapping field of view, slightly overlapping field of views, and that allows us to be able to uh, implement multi-camera odometry where visual features attract in a forward-looking camera, but then they can be moved to cameras that are on the left and right uh, uh, left and right of the facing. So here you can see the sensor uh, approaching a wall and where there are visual features are deprived here, we can start to track features that have been passed to the left and right cameras. Uh, so armed with this as a, as a source of odometry that can work in very narrow and confined environments, such as this, this narrow staircase here in Oxford. So this is a ground tree trajectory in green. And as uh, Linton is carrying the device up the, up the staircase, you can see uh, you can see how tight it is and the need to be able to have different camera systems that are able to contribute to the odometry and uh, not just a small field of view uh, or GB camera. Um, as it comes back down, you can see that there's very little drift. So effectively within narrow confined spaces, we can, we can compute an odometry source, um, taking advantage of uh, the, clip, um, uh, the clip model, we're able to take image snippets and to be able to uh, extract a, a semantic encoding with an open vocabulary. Um, and then we're starting to build up a uh, semantic map on top of our, our, our visual post graph. So the, the, this is the kind of scenarios where we want to operate on where, where robots are moving around or, or sensor systems are moving around in natural environments and um, not, not really making, uh, making the goal of building a visual map, but it's coming about through their natural motion. Um, here you can see an illustration of a pose graph being built, and as images are coming into the system, semantic labels being extracted for a particular uh, node in the pose graph using, using the clip model. So in this case, we have a, an office label for, for a particular point, but then across all of the, all of the nodes, we have the different classes, so corridor, office, kitchen, and so on. Um, and here you can see how we've refined the, diff the, the mapping system by first segmenting into different classes of rooms, then using some geometry. So, so the changes in the elevation are useful to be able to distinguish between corridors and staircases, while um, 
while then we're able to also use the transition between corridors and, and individual rooms to extract individual room instances. So just show a little video clip of, of that system. I can come close to the end of my slide. Um, you can see the this is a 3D view of multiple floors. So you can see the first floor, first floor of the building here, um, corridor spaces and different rooms, staircases being extracted in, in part because of the, the change in height and um, each of and then coming down to the ground floor and another example of that on a simulated data set from from lucas group uh, the we're interested in using this in in assistive technology so this is a, a prototype we've built for a human wearable system where with a focus towards um, assistive technology so it's, it combines the multi-camera system plus some depth cameras for for environment reconstruction and this is just an illustration of the challenges of um of uh putting this kind of multi-sensor vision system onto a walking system. So this is the, the footage of the, of the camera being undulated because it's attached to the, the thigh of the person. And you can see the trajectory of the, of the visual visual geometry system. It's a bit disimproved compared to, to what I'd like it to be, but we're kind of just setting out to build this, um, this application. Okay, um, I think at that point, I'll, I'll just skip over my last topic and take any questions. Okay, thank you very much.